What if I told you that color does not exist without light? That without light, there is no color. We only see color because of the light an object reflects to our eyes. As lighting technicians and designers, you probably already know that. We all know that. It gets taught to us at school. And yet, for a lot of lighting practitioners, color is the thing that tends to be thought about last. You know how it goes. Uh, what's my budget? How many lights do I have? Where will I put them? How should I number them? How bright should they be? And then, hmm, I wonder what color they should be. Now, I want to challenge that idea. I want to challenge the way you think about color and the way you talk about color. Why you choose it. How you choose it. Why you change it. How you change it. Does the source matter? Does the array matter? Color is about control. And lighting designers are control freaks, right? We want to control the time of day, the season, the location, the mood. The control of color since the introduction of LED lighting has become super important, and it's multi-layered. To have complete control over your color, you need to choose a fixture that offers you the degree of flexibility you require and a console that gives you the precision of control you expect. But before we get into the complexities of LED, allow me to strip this back a bit and show you what I mean about the importance of control. In this simple experiment, I have four colored light bulbs, blue, red, green, and yellow, and each one to a corresponding light switch. As you would expect, the blue switches the blue, red the red, green switches the green, and the yellow switches the yellow. Now, because I have control, if I decide to swap these light bulbs around, and we'll still find that the blue still switches the blue, the red still switches the red, the green still switches the green, and the yellow still switches the yellow. It's all about the importance of control. Historically, we would start with a white source, a full spectrum source, and we want to control the light that comes out by adjusting its intensity and adding a filter. Even if we don't add a filter and we're only adjusting its intensity, we're still adjusting its color. We've been manipulating light with color filters for centuries, removing portions of the spectrum that we don't want or need. With LED, this concept has been flipped on its head. Technically, when you're using LED, you start with nothing and you build your color up by adding in the bits of the spectrum that you want. So it stands to reason that the more bits of the spectrum you have at your disposal, the more you are able to add, and the more precisely and accurately the color will render on the object you're lighting. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time in a land far, far away, there lived a lighting designer. We'll call him Declan. Now Declan loved light, but he was excited by color most of all. The way that a pale tint could just make something shine, how a shift in color could change the mood from joyous to somber, could change time from night to day, and could underpin the emotional narrative of the play. It was so exciting. He would spend hours choosing color, and everything was going well. Until one day, the evil step costume designer came over during tech and asked if there was a way to make the costumes pop a bit more. Of course, says Declan accommodatingly. We just need to order some new gel, get it cut, and put into the lights. I should be able to show you in a few days. Now, leap forwards in time, and thanks to LED, Declan has the ability, dare I say the power, to control color on the fly, make those changes instantly, get those costumes to pop, manipulate color to a degree of precision that was simply not possible in that faraway land long, long ago and it's awesome. Now I know what you're probably thinking. I have LEDs on my rig. If I need to change the color, I can just use the color picker. And to a certain extent, you're right, you can. But it's important to remember that not all color pickers are created equal. Each console brand or manufacturer will have their own way of dealing with color, and the results may not always be what you're hoping for. At the end of the day, it's just maths. I'd love to be able to tell you that inside the console is a guy with a torch and a swatch book making sure that the color you've selected comes out as expected, but it's just maths. And everybody does the sums differently. And the more emitters you have, 
the more exponentially complicated that maths becomes. So, let's connect a Source 4 LED Series 2 to an EOS family console, Exhibit A. Then, let's connect the same fixture to another manufacturer's console, Exhibit B. Now, just by using the native color pickers, let's pick LEED 201 as our first example. And already you can see that they are wildly different, and that's down to the maths. The same thing happens with LEED 728 and again with Roscoe 58. Now some consoles are only capable of calculating color using RGB values, meaning that other emitters are simply ignored, and that's a whole lot of light that you're missing out on, both spectrally and in intensity. These inadequacies in the maths and the understanding of color can cost you precious time, as well as giving you poor results. Taking time to understand what's going on under the hood of your chosen console's color engine is really important in understanding how well it's going to be able to reproduce color. To be able to work successfully with LED and multi-emitter luminaires, you need a console that is so much more than just a color picker. So, how can this be better? Let's start where we all start, with white light. Each of these sources is producing white light, but each one has been constructed in a different way. And while they all look the same on a white surface, as soon as we start lighting colored objects, the results are totally different. I'm not saying that one is right or wrong, they're just different. And you get to decide whether the different is what you intended. These color recipes that are making up the white light are called metamers, and they're not new. Metamers have always been there. The difference is that we now get to control them. So what's going on here? If we take two emitters, two points in the spectrum, we can mix any color between those two points but in a straight line only. If we add in a third emitter, we can now mix any color that falls within the triangle between these points, but again in one way only. There is only one possible combination of these three colors that will hit a specific point in color space. But if we add in just one more emitter, an amber for example, then we start to reveal the power of metamers. Now, if I wanted to mix a pale amber, I could use this metamer. Or I could use this one. Or even this one. And each one of these new metamers will change the way we perceive the object being lit. That's a lot, right? Now you're probably thinking, but that's just one more thing I have to think about when I'm plotting. But here's the best part. On an EOS family console, a lot of this work has been done for you. Within the color picker, we have created three metamers for each color in the library, and they are listed as brightest, spectral, and hybrid. Tap on the Metama button to change the option and then reselect your color to see the new recipe. The console default is brightest. We've assumed you want the brightest light possible in your chosen color. Sometimes though, costumes and scenery may not react the way you intended due to the colors that are making up that Metama. Selecting spectral will give you a better spectral match to the filter in the swatch book, and hybrid will land somewhere in between. Let's say we wanted to use Lee 058, lavender. In brightest, you can see that the indigo is at a really high level, and this is part of what contributes to this being the brightest metamer. The indigo is a really punchy emitter. But this amount of indigo, which leans towards the ultraviolet side of the spectrum, may be causing your costumes to fluoresce unexpectedly. So, try the spectral metamer you can see the indigo intensity has dropped right down and the other emitters have increased to compensate. You will have a closer color match, but you may have sacrificed some intensity. And as you would then expect, the hybrid metamer sits somewhere in the middle. Choosing the best spectral match may mean a potential sacrifice of some intensity, but you get to decide on a cue by cue, moment by moment basis, which option is right for you. The choice of metamer not only affects the way a lit object is rendered, but 
it will also impact on the fades in and the fades out of that color. If you are using your fixtures in direct mode so that you have individual access to all the emitters, then there are some further adjustments that you can make to the colors you are working with. How many times have you created a look on stage that you are happy with, only to find that the costumes feel a little bit lifeless? Using hold color point allows you to maintain the color you have selected, but change the recipe to maybe add a bit more green or a bit less red. Real-time recipe adjustments. It's like baking chocolate chip cookies and being able to choose exactly how many choc chips are in each cookie and where they are within that cookie. Maybe that is too much control for you. Perhaps you just want the same color, but a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler. Making use of the tint tools gives you a quick way to do this. These controls will recalculate the output for you, offering you a version of your chosen color that is warmer or cooler than the default option. You care about the quality of light. It's why you do what you do. And if you care about light, then you must care about color too. It's impossible to separate the two. Having the ability to make these sometimes subtle changes is a hugely powerful tool to have at your fingertips. For example, let's say you're lighting a scene where someone dies. Imagine being able to just suck the warmth out of that light in their final moments, leaving them with a colder, more lifeless light. Or perhaps it's your annual production of Romeo and Juliet. Maybe your cool blue moonlight just wants to warm up that little bit when the pair fall in love on the balcony. Endless possibilities. We've said that color is about control. Well, what about the transitions? What happens when you move from one color to the next? Sometimes it goes as expected. And sometimes something goes really, really wrong. Being able to adjust not only the metamer of your chosen color, but also the way that it moves from one color point to another is something that we also have control over. Using the color path tools gives you a simple way to ensure that you move from color A to color B in a way that's both visually pleasing and that sits within your lighting narrative. Being able to make these changes quickly without having to do complex maths for individual emitters at the production desk is not only a time saver, but it's a sanity saver too. It's important to say that we've only scratched the surface here of what's possible with color and control. I encourage you to be curious. Never stop questioning, never stop experimenting, never stop discovering, and never stop creating. When I was starting out, and this is something that I still do to this day, I challenged myself to use one new color, something I've never used before on every show that I lit. And I want to extend an updated version of this challenge to you today. For each color palette that you store, create at least one other metamer of that color. The more you do it, the easier it becomes, and the more it becomes part of your instinctive workflow. And I guarantee you'll wonder, how did I ever used to do it before? We have some awesome tools and luminaires available now that offer you a degree of unprecedented control, and they're not just there for Broadway and the West End. We all deserve better lighting, better color, and better control. And the good news is, we can all have it right now.